Hello, noble friends. Welcome to Premierita Philosophy. I'm Dr. Peter Yong, and today I'd like to explore the mythological roots of philosophy in the work of Pherecydes of Syros. A peculiar, self-congratulatory narrative runs throughout contemporary accounts of the history of Western philosophy. According to this narrative, philosophy is, by its very nature, coextensive with a process of demythologization. Whereas Greek poets attempted to explain the world mythologically by invoking the unseen operations of gods and spiritual forces, Greek philosophy, on this account, was born through the renunciation of such occult explanations and the desire to explain the natural world exclusively on its own terms, that is, through what can be sensibly perceived. Such accounts take Thales of Miletus to be the progenitor of philosophy and present him, and the philosophers who came after him, as attempting to fashion a worldview based on reason, not myth, and to explain the natural world through its observable features rather than any kind of unseen spiritual reality. So, for example, the popular Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on the Pre-Socratics maintains, quote, Hailing from Miletus in Ionia, modern-day Turkey, Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes each broke with the poetic and mythological tradition handed down by Hesiod and Homer. Much of what we know about them suggests that they were proto-scientists, concerned with cosmogony. Their cosmogonies and cosmologies are oriented primarily by naturalistic explanations, descriptions, and conjectures, rather than traditional mythology. In other words, the Milesians ostensibly sought to explain the cosmos on its own terms, rather than pointing to the gods as the causes or progenitors of all natural phenomena." End quote. And a similar assertion is made in the entry on ancient Greek philosophy. Quote, Pre-Socratic thought marks a decisive turn away from mythological accounts towards rational explanations of the cosmos. Indeed, some pre-Socratics openly criticize and ridicule traditional Greek mythology, while others simply explain the world and its causes in material terms. This is not to say that the pre-Socratics abandoned belief in gods or things sacred, but there is a definite turn away from attributing causes of material events to gods, and at times a refiguring of theology altogether. The foundation of pre-Socratic thought is the preference and esteem given to rational thought over mythologizing. This movement towards rationality and argumentation would pave the way for the course of Western thought." End quote. Here, the practice of philosophy is defined as entailing both the rejection of mythological explanation and the acceptance of a purely naturalistic explanatory project. Yet, despite bolstering the egos of contemporary academic philosophers and helping them to justify their research projects, this account of the origins of Western philosophy is not supported by the historical record. For example, the fragments and testimonia concerning Thales present a much more ambiguous picture than the standard view suggests. I'll devote a later lecture to the ambiguous case of Thales. But, for now, I want to contend that even if we were to concede that Thales was an essentially demythologizing thinker, the standard narrative overlooks a historical figure whom some testimonia describe as a rival of Thales, who inaugurated an alternative tradition of philosophy, Pherecydes of Syros. As with other pre-Socratic philosophers, the evidence regarding Pherecydes' life is fragmentary and conflicting. Pherecydes is said to be the son of Babes and to have lived on Syros, an island near Delos in the 6th century BC. Classicist M. L. West points out that though Pherecydes is a Greek name, the name of Babes, his father, is Asiatic, occurring most frequently in Phrygia, Pisidia, and Galatia. According to some accounts, Pherecydes lived concurrently with the seven sages, and was even said to be one of them himself. For example, Diogenes Laertius records that, quote, Hermippus, in his book on the sages, says that the sages were seventeen, out of whom different people made selections of seven, and that they were Phrysides and others." End quote. 
Alexander, in his successions, maintains that Pherecydes studied with Pittacus, one of the seven sages, while others say he had no teacher. For example, Clement of Alexandria in the Stromata attests that, quote, No teacher is recorded for him, i.e. Thales, just as there is none for Pherecydes of Cyros either, with whom Pythagoras studied. End quote. And the Suda records that, quote, he, Pherecydes, did not have a teacher himself, but he trained himself after he had acquired the secret books of the Phoenicians. End quote. Given such conflicting evidence, it is difficult to differentiate between history and Geschichte in the life of Pherecydes. For his life, like that of Pythagoras, whom some sources identify as a student, takes on a legendary dimension in our sources. He is said, for instance, to have been a miracle worker, with Diogenes Laertius recording that, quote, Many marvels are reported about him. While he was walking on the beach of Samos, he saw a boat sailing with a fair wind and said that soon it would sink, and it sank before his eyes. When he drank water from a well, he predicted that there would be an earthquake two days later, and it happened. When he traveled to Olympia, he advised his host, Perilaus, in Messene, to leave his home together with his household. But he was not persuaded, and Messene was captured. He told the Lacedaemonians to hold neither gold nor silver in honor, as Theopompus says in his marvels. He had received this order in a dream from Heracles, who that same night ordered the kings obey Pherecydes. But some people attach this story to Pythagoras. End quote. Pherecydes is here presented as a kind of shamanic figure. He is said to have precognition about future events, such as earthquakes, military victories, and the sinking of ships, and to be able to operate within the dream world and communicate with the gods who reside there. In addition to the passage from Diogenes mentioned above, where Pherecydes commands the Spartans to honor neither silver nor gold, several other accounts also link Pherecydes to Sparta. Plutarch in the Aegis records that, quote, Although Terpander, Thales, and Phrysides were foreigners, they are particularly honored in Sparta because they constantly sang and proclaimed philosophically the same things as Lycurgus. End quote. And elsewhere, in Pelopidas, Plutarch reports that Pherecydes even died as a human sacrifice at the hands of the Spartans, and that they kept his skin as a kind of talisman or relic which presumably contained his sacred power. Plutarch recounts, quote, Pherecydes the sage was killed by the Lacedaemonians, and, in conformity with the oracle, his skin was preserved by the kings. End quote. Yet, there are actually multiple accounts of Pherecydes' death. Some say he died from a disease and was cared for in his last days by Pythagoras. Others say he died during the battle between the Ephesians and the Magnesians, and used the opportunity to predict, or possibly bring about, the victory of the Ephesians. And yet others say he went to Delphi and threw himself from Mount Corycius. Pherecydes' written work, which some sources report to be the first Greek treatise composed in prose, went under various titles. The Five Nook, the Mixture of the Gods, or simply Theogony. Like Hesiod's Theogony, it contained a theology comprising the birth and succession of the gods. Yet, it also diverged from Hesiod's account in several crucial respects. Indeed, Pherecydes' Theogony may even have been written as a self-conscious alternative to Hesiod's. The difference between them was apparently dramatic enough for Theopompus to assert that Pherecydes was the first to write for the Greeks about nature and the gods, despite the fact that Hesiod's Theogony was composed earlier. Though Pherecydes wrote after Homer and Hesiod, he must have articulated a theology so novel that he was credited with being the first to write about nature and the gods. Likewise, Aristotle goes on to label Pherecydes as a mixed theologian. Unlike previous theologies, which claimed that the good gradually emerged and developed through time, culminating in the Olympian order of Zeus, Pherecydes, according to Aristotle, maintains that the good is engendered first. 
Pherecydes' primary gods, Kronos, Zas, and Thani, are posited as eternal first principles which ground the cosmic order. And unlike previous myths which depict a theomachy between the Titans, led by Kronos, and the Olympians, led by Zeus, Pherecydes' first principles work in harmony with each other. Pherecydes' theogony can be briefly summarized as follows. In the beginning there were three eternal gods, Kronos, Zas, and Thani. Kronos ejaculates seed containing the fundamental elements of fire, air, and water, and then places it in varying proportions in five nooks from which emerge the first created gods. This is the first act of creation. The second act of creation is then performed by Zas when he marries Thani. Before the marriage, he transforms himself into Eros, weaves a robe for Thani, and embroiders Gay, the earth, and Ogenos, ocean, upon it. In this manner, he fashions the earth as we know it. When Zas presents Thani with her robe at the wedding, her name is changed to Gay. And Zas's name may also be changed to Zeus, and Kronos, the god of time, to Kronos, the titan, at this point. Finally, there is a cosmic battle between Kronos and Alphionius, a snake god, and their corresponding armies. They set terms for the battle such that the side to fall into Ogenos will be forced to reside there, while the victor will retain control of the heavens and dwell therein. Kronos and his troops win the battle, and he is crowned, and Zeus distributes honors among the gods. Though Pherecydes' mythological treatise was likely brief, it can be shown to anticipate, if not inaugurate, many of the revolutionary ideas that would come to define later Greek philosophy. In contrast to Hesiod's originary chaos, which is said to come to be, Pherecydes postulates three eternally existent deities, Zas, Kronos, and Thani. This is stipulated at the very outset of his book, which is preserved by Diogenes Laertius as follows, quote, The book, its beginning is, Zas and Kronos were always, and Thani was. But the name of Thani became Earth when Zas gave her Earth as a present. End quote. Pherecydes here explicitly states, for perhaps the first time in Western philosophy, that the gods always were. There was never a time in which they were not. This sentiment was echoed in the later philosophical tradition. For example, Aristotle records that, quote, Xenophanes used to say that those who say the gods are born are just as impious as those who say they die. For in both cases, the result is that there is a certain time when the gods do not exist." End quote. It is not implausible to suppose that Pherecydes' novel account of divine eternity was motivated by a concern to articulate a suitable metaphysical first principle, or arche. Indeed, later authors explicitly adopted such a reading and identified Pherecydes' three primary deities with first principles. Eudamus, for instance, maintains that, quote, Pherecydes of Cyros says that Zas always exists, as well as Kronos and Thani, the three first principles, end quote. And historian Hermann Schibli observes that, quote, It was the mark of pre-Socratic philosophers in general that a true arche, whether a divine being or a divine substance, or, as often, a blend of the two, had no beginning at a past point in time." End quote. Presumably, a true arche must be eternal, since the explanation of one temporally conditioned event by another would seem to lead to an infinite regress. For instance, if we attempt to explain a temporally conditioned event, T1, by a further temporally conditioned event, T2, Reason would demand that we explain this new explanans, i.e. T2. We might attempt to do so by appealing to another temporally conditioned event, say T3. But this too would require a further explanation, ad infinitum. It seems that to reach a first principle that would satisfy the demands of reason, we would have to appeal to something that is unconditioned by time, i.e. something eternal. 
In this manner, it is possible to trace the beginnings of metaphysics back to Pherecydes mythology. Moreover, Pherecydes also anticipates the later Platonic identification of the Arche with the good. Unlike Hesiod, who depicted goodness as slowly evolving through struggles between the gods and the solidification of Olympian power under Zeus, Pherecydes claims that the good has always existed. Aristotle attests to this doctrine when he observes that, quote, There is a difficulty and a cause of criticism to those who easily resolve their doubts concerning how the elements and principles relate to the good and the beautiful. The difficulty is this, whether any of those is such a thing as we mean when we speak of the good itself and the best, or whether this is not so, and they are, on the contrary, later in origin. The theologians seem to agree with those of our contemporaries who say that it is not so, but that the good and the beautiful appear as the nature of things progresses. The ancient poets agree with this inasmuch as they say that the first principles, such as night and heaven or chaos or okeanos, do not have kingship and rule, but rather that Zeus does. It is only incumbent upon them to say such things because their rulers of the world do change, since, at any rate, those of them who give a mixed account, in that they do not say everything in myth, such as Pherecydes and certain others, do posit the first creating principle as the best, as do the Magi and some later philosophers, like both Empedocles and Anaxagoras. The former made love an element, and the latter made mind a principle." End quote. Here, Aristotle contrasts poets whose first principles do not have kingship and rule, since these are instead attributed to Zeus's later Olympian regime, with Pherecydes' account which posits the first creating principle as the best. For Pherecydes, ideal rule need not be wrested from chaos by brute force and Machiavellian guile as it is in previous Greek mythology. Rather, goodness stands eternal as a fundamental principle of reality. Because Aristotle stipulates that purely mythological accounts must entail a non-identity between the arche and the good, he maintains that Pherecydes holds to a mixed account. Yet this stipulation strikes me as misguided. For we need not rigidly associate mythology with any one particular metaphysical outlook. Myths can be used to illustrate a variety of different worldviews. Various world religions, for instance, each present their worldviews mythologically. Yet the metaphysical details of those worldviews still differ from each other in dramatic ways. And Pherecydes' identification of the first principle with the good also coincides with another key philosophical revolution, an ethical depiction of the gods. Pherecydes' gods, unlike those of Homer and Hesiod, act uprightly. They are not subject to human vices such as anger or lust, and they do not assault each other or commit adultery. Much less do they commit the more than human outrages depicted by the earlier poets, such as castrating their fathers or eating their children and wives. Rather, Pherecydes presents a surprisingly moral mythology. In it, Kronos, existing from eternity, neither has a father with whom to contend, nor a son against whom he must struggle for power, since Zas is not his son. And since there is no battle of succession between Zas and Kronos, there is no corresponding war between the Olympians and the Titans. Instead, Kronos and Zas work together, each contributing to the creation of the universe in his own way. Kronos as a primal begetting force, and Zas as a cosmic artisan. In this manner, Pherecydes' mythology is motivated by the same moral concerns that animated the later philosophical tradition. For example, we can see Pherecydes as anticipating Xenophanes criticism that, quote, Homer and Hesiod have attributed to the gods all things that among men are sources of blame and censure. Thieving committing adultery, and deceiving each other." End quote. And Plato's contention that the poets give, quote, a bad image of what the gods and heroes are like, 
telling the greatest falsehood about the most important things. I mean, Hesiod telling us about how Uranus behaved, how Cronus punished him for it, and how he was in turn punished by his own son." End quote. And though Pherecydes does recount a battle between the gods, it is not a battle between the primary gods, but with the serpent Ophionius and his followers, the Ophionidae. The Platonist philosopher Celsus took Pherecydes' story to be the source for the later Christian tale of Satan's fall from heaven. Celsus summarizes Pherecydes' account as follows, quote, Pherecydes, who is much more ancient than Heraclitus, invented the myth of one army set in order against another army, gave the command of the one to Cronos, and of the other to Ophionius, and recounted their challenges and combats, and that they made an accord according to which whichever ones of them fell into Ogenos would be defeated, while those who expelled them and defeated them would possess the heavens." End quote. We thus learn that there are two warring armies in Pherecydes' account, one led by Cronos and the other by Ophionius, and clear terms of engagement are agreed upon in this war, with the side falling into Agenus to be declared the loser, and the side remaining above to be declared the winner, having a rightful claim to the heavens. Unlike previous depictions of the Typhonomachy, in which Zeus is taken off guard and responds to the monster Typhon's assaults through brute force, Cronos is depicted as being well aware of the situation and responding according to a rational plan with agreed-upon rules. In this manner, Pherecydes infuses his heavenly battle with a moral character. Cronos and his forces prove to be victorious, pushing Ophionius and his serpent army into the ocean and Cronus is crowned before everyone. Though Cronus led the heavenly army and was honored as victor, it is probable that Zeus also engaged in combat, given his role as the primary artificer of creation and his authority to punish gods who commit outrageous acts. So, even though Pherecydes includes a story of a battle between the gods, he narrates it in a way that prevents the eternal gods from fighting amongst each other and from relinquishing their rule to a new divine lineage, and he thereby anchors the moral order in the eternal order of the gods. Another crucial innovation of Pherecydes is the idea of a demiurge, the idea that God is a great artisan who formed the world as a work of art. It is customary to maintain that this idea first emerged in Greek philosophy with Plato's Timaeus, but Pherecydes' treatise predates this account. In Pherecydes' myth, Zas takes on the demiurgic work of crafting the world when he marries Thawne. The Grenfell Papyrus records the episode as follows, quote, For him they make buildings, many and great, and when they had finished them all, the objects, male servants, female servants, and everything else that is necessary, when then everything is ready, they perform the wedding. And when the third day of the wedding comes, then Zas makes a robe, great and beautiful, and on it he embroiders earth, Ogenos, and the houses of Ogenos. Zas then speaks to Thani. Since I want this marriage to be yours, it is to you that I honor with this. But you, receive my greeting and be my wife. They say that these were the first anacalypteria that were performed, and from this time this custom has existed, for both gods and men. And she answers him, receiving the robe from him." End quote. This story attests to a twofold design of the cosmos. First, Zas weaves the world as a wedding gift for Thani. He embroiders the lands and oceans onto the robe he fashions for her, crafting thereby the earth as we know it. Here Zas operates as an intelligent designer, creating the world to be an object of beauty. And like a dedicated craftsman, Zas skillfully fashions his magnum opus with love and devotion. Proclus even reports that Zas transformed himself into Eros when undertaking the work of creation. And when married to Zas and endowed with her robe, Thani is given the new name of Gay or Earth. In the renaming of Thani, 
our Earth comes to be. Isidore records that Pherecydes used the image of a winged oak with an embroidered robe upon it as a symbol of this completed creation. Second, Pherecydes, taking pains to ground the legitimacy of human institutions and practices in the world of the gods, maintains that our social world is intelligently designed. For instance, by providing an etiology of the practice of Anacalypteria, Pherecydes attempts to root the human institution of marriage in a divine archetype. Shibley explains, quote, In sum, in the marriage of Zas and Thawney, the divine world touches upon the human world. The institutions and customs of men are traced back to the gods. In Pherecydes' book, marriages are literally made in heaven, as each marriage reenacts the first divine marriage. In mythical thought, human acts are real because they repeat the deeds of the gods." End quote. And Pherecydes provides a similar etiology for the banquet table at the wedding feast. Diogenes Laertius recounts, quote, And he, Pherecydes, also said that the gods call the banquet table a table for offerings. End quote. Once again, Pherecydes grounds a human practice in a corresponding practice of the gods. Shibley suggests that, in appealing to the terms used by the gods, Pherecydes expresses the ancient view that the gods have a language of their own, in which they call things by their correct names. One would, by using this divine language, speak the truth of things. Such a view is attested to, for example, in Plato's Cratylus, in a discussion between Socrates and Hermogenes. Quote, well, if that doesn't suit you, you'll have to learn from Homer and the other poets. And where does Homer say anything about names, Socrates, and what does he say? In lots of places. The best and most important are the ones in which he distinguishes between the names humans call things and those the gods call them. Or don't you think that these passages tell us something remarkable about the correctness of names? Surely the gods call things by their naturally correct names, or don't you think so?" End quote. Here, Plato attests to an ancient view held by Homer and the other poets, that distinguishes human language from the language of the gods. According to this view, the names used by the gods, presumably in contrast to those used by us, correspond to the true nature of reality. In this manner, not only is our physical cosmos the result of divine craftsmanship, but that same design also permeates our human life world. Finally, Pherecydes is also said to be the first Greek philosopher to have articulated the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Though Homer depicted a form of disembodied existence after death, it was a vague and spectral existence in the underworld. All that remained after death was an emaciated form of consciousness. When recounting Odysseus's journey to the underworld in Book 11 of the Odyssey, Homer depicts the gathered shades as needing to drink sacrificial blood in order to speak, and he portrays the hero Achilles as attesting that he would rather be a peasant in the world of men than a ruler among the dead. In contrast, Pherecydes presents the revolutionary idea that the soul has a positive reality of its own, and can persist unharmed after the death of the body. Cicero, in his Tuscan Disputations, testifies that Pherecydes is the first in the West to have articulated such a doctrine. Quote, Indeed, it takes a great intellect to withdraw the mind from the senses and divert thought from habit. So, for my part, I believe that there were also others in so many centuries. But, as far as the literary records go, Pherecydes of Cyros first said that the souls of men are eternal. And he is clearly ancient, for he lived when my clansman was ruling. This teaching his disciple Pythagoras greatly supported." End quote. In contrast to previous thinkers who likened the soul to a sensible object, identifying it with what is experienced by the physical body, 
Pherecydes, according to Cicero, had the strength of mind to abstract from these familiar associations and consider consciousness in itself. As a result, he was able to discern that the soul of man is eternal. And Cicero goes on to note that this doctrine was adopted by Pythagoras in the Pythagorean school. Pherecydes paired the doctrine of the immortality of the soul with the doctrine of metempsychosis the idea that the soul reincarnates after death. So, for example, the Suda reports that, quote, He, Pherecydes, was the first to introduce the idea of metempsychosis. End quote. And this acceptance of the doctrine of metempsychosis introduces an ineluctably moral dimension to human life, since the soul is eternal and can face judgment for its actions. We see this moral dimension of Pherecydes' thought attested to by Themistius when he declares that, quote, Thus, the divine spirit of the king takes forethought to keep his hands pure from even just bloodshed, more than Pherecydes and Pythagoras, so that he joined in compelling and forcing even the other of the tyrants, for whom death was necessary upon acting with violence, to become his own tyrannicide. End quote. Here, Pherecydes, like Pythagoras, is said to have warned people to avoid unjust bloodshed. In the case of Pythagoras, the doctrine of reincarnation motivated him to extend this principle to the animal world and accept a vegetarian diet. It is possible that this view had its roots in Pherecydes' teaching, but it cannot be determined for certain. Pherecydes likely articulated his doctrine of metempsychosis within the cosmology set forth earlier in his work, so that the story of the soul, the microcosm, corresponds to the story of the cosmos, the macrocosm. Recall that, for Pherecydes, Kronos created the universe by taking his seed and placing it within five nooks, or mukhoi, from which the first created gods emerged. In like manner, Pherecydes associates the entrance and departure of the soul into earthly life with mukhoi through which the soul passes. Porphyry, for example, records that, quote, Pherecydes of Cyros speaks of nooks, of hollows, of caves, of doors, of gates, and by means of these terms allegorically the births and departures of the souls. End quote. And, just as the first act of creation was associated with the outflow of Kronos' seed, so too is the incarnation of the human soul associated with an outflow. The medieval writer, Aponius, reports that the soul had two aspects for Pherecydes. It was both eternal and served as a principle of life for the body. He explains, quote, They say that a certain Pherecydes, before all others, taught his students the doctrine that the soul of man is immortal, and that it is the life of the body. And he believed on the one hand that it is breathed into us from heaven, and on the other that it is supplied by earthly seeds." End quote. Pherecydes thus seems to link the eternal soul to a particular body through the medium of earthly seed. And Porphyry likewise reports that, for Pherecydes, the incarnation of the soul was connected to the outflow of seed. He attests, quote, The other account is that this is the moment of the soul's entry into the embryo, when the semen is deposited, as it would not be able to be productively retained in the womb unless the soul were to complete the union by its entry from outside. Here, especially, Numenios, and the interpreters of Pythagoras's hidden meanings understand as semen the river Ameles in Plato, and the Styx in Hesiod and the Orphics, and the outflow in Pherecydes. End quote. The incarnation of the soul into the body is here associated with the outflow of semen into the womb and the conception of an embryo. As a result, then, it appears that Pherecydes' account of human life mirrored his account of the life of the universe. Just as the cosmos began through the mixture of Kronos' seed within the five primordial mukhoi, so too does the soul's experience of a particular human life begin with the outflow of seed into the womb and the consequent conception of a body. 
So, far from constituting a break with mythology, some of the central concerns of philosophy actually have their roots in myth. Pherecydes of Cyros, with his mythology of the five nook god mixing, is the first thinker in the Greek tradition to have introduced the quest for an eternal arche, the first to articulate a distinctively moral theology, the first to have forged the idea of a creator god, and the first to have taught the doctrines of reincarnation and the immortality of the soul. Given such a profound influence, it is no wonder that Josephus would attest that Pherecydes was one of, quote, the first among the Greeks to philosophize about celestial phenomena and divine matters, end quote. As a result, many of the concerns of later philosophy appear to flow not from some kind of naturalistic rejection of myth, but from what Aristotle calls a mixed theology, a worldview that is at once both mythological and rational. And, even more profoundly, if the legends are to be believed which credit Pherecydes' knowledge to his study of magic and the secret books of the Phoenicians, then the true roots of philosophy lie in the occult. It is thus reasonable to ask with Tertullian, quote, Indeed, we know that it is proper to magic to search out secrets through the catabolic and paradral and pythonic spirits. For did not also Pherecydes, the teacher of Pythagoras, divine, not to say dream, by these kinds of arts perhaps?